everybody, and uh, looks like you're all very cheerful and raring to go. Um, the uh, we we're going to be working on our ag proposal for the covert um, fund uh, today, and. Um, we have E.B. Uh, Fleury with us from the agency uh, to uh, give us a little overview on, I believe, uh, whatever you want to give us an overview on, but I believe it, it's going to be on how you put your program together and, and how it's supposed to um, help our, our struggling uh, dairy people. And if you could... If you could fill us in, maybe in the, the million that's going to the processors. Uh, we haven't talked a whole lot about the cheesemakers and the processors and that portion. So if you could fill us in a little on how that's supposed to work and be administered, uh, it would uh, be most helpful, I think, for the committee. So. Okay. Good morning and welcome, uh, E.B. Thank you, Bobby, and, um, and, and to the rest of the, the Senate Ag um, Committee. Um, I actually prepared a uh, testimony that I would like to just read as, a, as an update of what's going on for our farming and our processing community in the dairy side um, that I've had coming to me. Um, my role at the agency in dealing with regulating both of those, those groups, um, I have direct contact with numerous farmers and our processors of all shapes and sizes. Um, and, it, and it hits on just the importance of, of the bill and everything that you're, you all are investing so much time in and trying to get right. Um, so I would like to just read that testimony and then I'm happy to answer whatever questions or things you have. And if I don't know the answers, I can, can get them for you all or, or get the right people to speak to you all about that. And uh, Linda, I sent you uh, the testimony that I'm going to read if you wanted to email that out or, or post it online. So I sent that a few minutes before it started. Um, but to introduce myself again, uh, I'm E.B. Flory and serve as the Dairy Section Chief at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. And since COVID-19 first took hold of our world, our Dairy Section team have been on the front lines helping to keep our dairy food supply safe and available for all consumers. Uh, COVID-19 has impacted many sectors in our state, but the impact to dairy farmers and processors has been particularly severe as they rack up increasing losses, continue to operate, and are unable to mitigate their expenses. In Vermont, our dairy farms make up over 80% of Vermont's farmland and contribute $3 million in cash circulation each day in Vermont. Dairy accounts for 70% of Vermont's agricultural sales with over $1.3 billion in dairy products and byproduct sales each year. Of this $1.3 billion in annual sales, artisan cheesemakers account for the largest amount for one product category at 650 million. This number exceeds the direct sales value of fluid milk by over 50%. Overall, dairy generates $2.2 billion in economic activity in Vermont each year. Due to COVID-19, I cannot easily explain how grave the situation is for our farmers and processors, but many are clinging to a thread. Since March 1st, we have lost 17 dairy farms, including 14 farms we lost in just the last month. This equates to 2% of total dairy farms in Vermont. Those farms consisted of four SFOs, eight CFSOs, and five MFOs. We are in a time of unprecedented crisis and our largest agricultural sector is confronting its greatest risk in decades. Beyond our dairy farmers, COVID-19 devastated one market, our value added dairy processors, that has been the shining light of our dairy industry for many years. Our Vermont dairy processors produce world renowned cheese, butter, yogurt, and ice cream, and many of their markets disappeared overnight. The Vermont Cheese Council released a survey showing that cheesemakers lost 25 to 90 percent of their markets based because of the pandemic. Our processors are broadly experiencing this market drop, which is also contributing to the rapid milk price declines for our farmers. 
The Vermont Cheese Council has estimated that over $10 million worth of lost sales occurred in April alone. Cheesemakers are responding by selling off cattle or entire herds or not purchasing milk from neighboring farms to meet the loss in market demand. Long term, this will cause cheesemakers to be under smaller cash flows with businesses that were already on narrow, narrow budget constraints. For each cheesemaker reducing milk, processing levels will result in less cheese being put away. The trickle down effect is less cheese to sell and reduce cash flow for the future. If sales continue to remain at this level of loss through the rest of this year, cheesemakers will have to cut employees, downsize operations, and currently 10% are looking to possibly close their doors permanently. The market trend impacting cheesemakers can also be felt across all our dairy processors and is playing a large part in the price suffering our dairy farmers are facing. Approximately 54% of the licensed dairy processors in the state register at the smallest level of production at 500 pounds or less of milk processed daily. These processors create the majority of our diverse dairy products in the marketplace. They also include some cheese processors that pay grass-based dairy farmers $30 a hundred weight or more for non-organic milk. These processors allow small dairy farms to not only survive, but thrive. 31% <laughs> of our processors are in the range of 500 pounds to 10,000 pounds of milk processed daily. And the last four categories of processors combined for approximately 15% of our dairy processors. Vermont's dairy processors are a hard earned success story and their many small operations make huge economic impacts in their rural communities. Their diversity in size and high quality nutritious products created with Vermont milk provides a steady and reliable food supply for all Vermonters to have access to be food secure. Without these processors, our milk will leave the state in larger quantities and make Vermont more reliant on large supply chains to bring in food for our citizens. These operations also provide needed employment in our rural communities. During COVID-19, Vermont's dairy processors have done all they can to protect their employees' health and safety and to maintain our critical food supply. Our dairy processors have created a culture that many other states have tried to imitate. None are able to replicate the artisan dairy community that divine, defines Vermont dairy. I see individuals moving from other states to Vermont to become part of this unique community. Just last year, we had a father and daughter team move from Massachusetts to start a goat dairy and cheese processing facility. They uprooted their families to make new roots and invest in Vermont. I myself sought out Vermont and its dairy landscape to make my permanent roots and invest in a dairy culture that I believe in. Our dairy farmers are floundering from a 26% price drop caused by the pandemic. Many of our processors lost their markets, are coping with additional expenses and need to pivot, adapt and begin distributing into new markets. Our processors will play an integral part in the future of Vermont agriculture. Our farmers need processors to turn their milk into products that consumers will purchase and establish in newly developed marketplaces. This adaptability includes additional costs for new equipment necessary to package final products differently to be shipped directly to consumers. As the dairy section chief and someone who regularly works with dairy farmers and processors, I have a close up view of the pandemic's impact on dairy. The economic freefall is unprecedented in my experience, and I am extremely concerned that without assistance, many of our farmers and processors will not survive this public health and economic crisis. The news from our farms is partially evidenced by our 17 farm failures is grim. Vermont relies on dairy for its open lands, rural economic output and jobs, and in many ways, its unique character and way of life. I encourage you to give due consideration to support Vermont's dairy farms and award-winning dairy processors of cheese, butter, yogurt, and ice cream. I thank you for your time and consideration of the current state of Vermont's largest agricultural sector. And I'm happy to take any questions that you all may have. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, E.B. That's um, quite a report you just gave us. Um, I, I, heard that we'd lost some farms, uh, but 17 is uh, quite, a, quite a number. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us again, 
I was trying to keep up with you, but I didn't <laughs> write down the, the different categories that we lost of the 17. Yep. Um, so of the 17, and this is from March 1st, um, four were, were small farms, eight were certified small farms, and five were, were medium farms. So four, eight, and, and five. And five. Yes, sir. So um, no, uh, no large farms, but we did lose some medium farms. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're really seeing in the in the pandemic that the the smallest processors and and farmers are the ones that are the most vulnerable. Yeah. And it's very concerning. Uh, Rose. Yeah, thanks, Bobby, and thanks, Evie. Um, uh, I, I, it sort of to pick up on this small farm, large farm processor conversation. I, I mean, based on your testimony and the farms going out and also what we've heard from testimony from dairy farmers, uh, it, it seems like the impact has been greater at the small end of the operation, small, medium, rather than the large end for both processors and for far dairy farmers. Um, obviously, the large processors and farmers have been impacted, but because their businesses tend to be uh, more stable or whatever, I don't know the right word, but they, they don't seem to be as directly vulnerable. Is that, is that my um, accurate? <laughs> I know you have to be careful. I, 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 um, I will, everyone is very vulnerable at this point. What the reason why I believe, and this is my personal opinion, that we're seeing the impacts on the smaller scale is that they have less resources to try to spread this cost loss. Right. Um, I do personally believe that our large farms and our large processors are hurting just the same. It's just that they have more resources to try to spread this. Mm -hmm. If something is not done quickly for all sizes, shapes and sizes of our farms and our processors, we're going to start losing large operations as well. Um, I think it's just um, like with a lot of things that occur, a lot of the times the, the trend starts with the smaller sizes and it starts working its way up. And I do believe that if action isn't taken to help all of our processors and all of our farms, regardless of their size, we're going to start seeing trends of like the, the MFO size or our larger processors starting to, starting to chip away as well. Um, okay. it, is, it is very concerning at this point. I, you know, we have probably, I don't know for sure, we haven't, but I, I think we have uh, as a committee fewer resources to work with than the governor's proposal. I don't think we have $50 million on the table is my impression. So we have to figure out how do we target that, whatever money we have, 30 million or whatever we have to the most effective you know, place. And so trying to figure out how do we help all farms, because we also have an interest in helping non-dairy farms, um, and that wasn't part of the, the governor's package and the agency's package. How do we help all processors, farms, and, and farmers, and farm workers, and all, all the people affected most effectively with a smaller pot of money? So that's, that's this conundrum that I keep running around in my head, and how do we make that work? Um, so if the most vulnerable at this point are the small medium, maybe that's where our focus needs to be. But I, I hear you about down the road, it's gonna spread up as well. So just thinking out loud here. <laughs> and I, and I, I mentioned some of the, the market numbers and the amount, of, the amount of impact that dairy has on our economy. And I just mentioned that for perspective of, I'm not saying that other industries have not been impacted, um, but I do think the governor's proposal was looking at yeah. the amount that Vermont dairy's industry, what it, what it is in size compared to other agricultural industries in the state. And 
part of dairy being so vulnerable, especially on the farm side, is the four or five years of very reduced prices that we have. Um, our dairy farmers of any size have not had a good year in the past four years. And so they came, this was supposed to be the year where we were going to start getting back to a closer price of what it actually costs to produce this. So our farmers went into this pandemic already strapped financially, and that goes for any size farm. And so now this pandemic has, has hit and there are not resources for them to try to survive this. <laughs> and this downturn that dairy has, has been in for the past four years um, is not the same trend that is seen across other food sectors and farm sectors. I'm not saying that those sectors are not struggling and I'm not trying to say that, um, that their issues aren't valid, but there is a, a bigger story behind dairy as to part of why the situation is so dire. And as Secretary Tebbets has mentioned, like this money was looked at to as survival. And that's how I view it with the communications I've had with our farmers and processors. Like right now we are in a survival mode to try to get through the summer and into the fall and hoping that markets will return. Um, but for dairy, this is legitimately um, surviving in the identity of, of, our, of our agricultural economy. Um, anything else, Ruth? I'm, I'm good for now. <laughs> um, do, you, do you have the figures on the top of your head about um, like the different farm groups, we've got them broken out into four sizes. Um, and uh, do you have anything uh, that you could tell us about the percentage of our total milk, uh, where, it, uh, where it comes from, which size or, or anything along you know, those lines? Um, I do not have that information um, off the top of my head. That would actually be a tricky number to come up with. Um, milk pounds are reported by a BTU, which is like for the for the co-ops or for processors, it's it's a territory that they get milk from, and it's a way that we identify where the milk came from each farm for tracing and other things. And those reports are given to us in lump sums monthly. They're not broken out individually because that gets into proprietary information because breaking out per farm to then break it out by farm size, it gets into what people are actually being paid because it would be their exact pounds. So we don't, we do not track that. We don't have data on every single farm on that. It is lumped as a, as a group by territory that we have pounds. Yeah. It seems like in our testimony, I don't know if it was from the big farms or who it was from, I don't recall, but it seems like the um, medium and large farms were reported to us like 85% of the, of the total production and the small and small certifieds were 15 percent, but I don't, I, I don't know. That's numbers in my head, but I don't know where it came from and if uh, it's accurate or not. I, I can't speak to it accurately. So yeah. Uh, other questions for EB? Uh, got uh, Chris, Brian, and Anthony. Chris. Thanks. Um, thank you, EB. I, I wonder. Um, <clears throat> we've been we've been uh, wrestling with how to provide assistance and also recognize that a lot of uh, farmers are interested in some help, whether it's sort of economic planning, transition planning. Um, you know, we, we kind of have these two realities coming at us where, where farmers directly say to us, yes, we need that help. And then we say, well, let's figure out how to help them while we provide grants. And people say, well, how dare you condition our grants? Um, 
so we're trying to be very sensitive here. And, and I think one of the ideas that we've come up with is to just simply, um, as farms are applying for grants, have a very short few questions so that we can understand, you, you know, yes, I'd like to talk to somebody about uh, business planning, diversification planning, succession planning, whatever. There are a lot of dynamics going on in addition to the last many years. Um, and, and we've heard from, um, you know, folks that that would be helpful and we don't want to make it sort of uh, us, the legislature telling farms what they have to do, but we'd like to be able to better pair that up. Are you in a position to help us craft that? We're getting pretty close to where we're going to have to say, you know, the agency shall work with VHCB to come up with a short survey or something like that. <laughs> because I'm not convinced we should put the language of a survey into legislation. Are you the right person? Would you be willing? Are you interested in helping us with that? And it's, again, it's just trying to arrive at a list of say, okay, here are the priorities. Here are people who are eager for this kind of input. We know there's a, a lot more demand than, than we have resources, although we're also looking at putting some resources into VHCB and others that do some of this work with our farmers and partner with them. But are you somebody that can help, we could turn to in the agency to help craft um, that kind of- I think, I think the yeah. best person would be Diane Bothfeld. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in my um, in my post with, with regulatory and dealing with the businesses and the farms, but our ag dev division is doing a lot. And I know with the Dairy Innovation Center, um, different things are being explored as well. Um, so I think Diane would be the best person to tie in what you all are looking at to see like, is this something that the agency is trying to pursue already? Or is it something that could try to be expedited and be a part of this process or not? Um, Diane would be the best person to speak to is whether um, things are being duplicated or this is the route that we could approach this with. So, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, buddy. So EB, um, I'm very sympathetic to uh, the situation with, uh, with all of our farmers and especially the dairy. Um, the proposal from the governor was for 50 million. Uh, Senator Hardy's indicated that we may have uh, received some information that it may or may not come close to that number when all is said and done. So are you aware of any other federal help uh, that, that uh, the dairy farmers in Vermont and the dairy processors could take advantage of that we haven't heard about yet? Um, for the dairy processors, um, it has seemed pretty limited other than you know, the, the PPP program. There's been some things with food banks and stuff through USDA. Um, and the, the, the food bank programs for processors, a lot of it has to get into like what size of processor you are, what products are you making? Um, so it's kind of limited, in my opinion, when you look at our, you know, 54% of like our, our smaller processors being the chunk of the processors in the state, a lot of them, it's not going to fit their business structure. Um, so a little mixed on that end of things for processors. On the farm side, um, the PPP program was an option for them. Um, most recently, USDA announced um, sign up, not just for dairy farmers, but for vegetable farmers, beef farmers, commodity producers, just a whole gamut um, of showing losses. And I'm not, uh, I haven't memorized what the, the payment rates and whatnot are with that, but USDA did open up a program, I believe on May 26th um, for all sorts of commodity producers and also vegetable fruit, berry producers, and things like that, too. And other than that, those are the main things that I'm, I'm aware of. Thank you. And, and don't, uh, I read something about you guys had a program going up to $25,000 to help mm -hmm. some farms with. Mm -hmm. Yep, and the, the applications have, have closed on that, and our Ag Dev office is, is working very diligently trying to get those um, get them ranked and get them to the board um, that would make decisions on, on who gets funding for that. 
Yeah. Um, Anthony? Sure. Um, I appreciate your testimony. I'm trying to think about ways that we could target assistance to smaller processors. And I'm wondering when you talk about small processors, do we talk down to the level of on-farm processors, meaning a single farm that's maybe making cheese or whatever? I'm wondering how you define, how small are we talking? That, I mean, I think that, we are talking yeah. about those folks. I just yeah. wonder if we can identify those folks and talk a little bit about what they're facing. Yeah, so um, those, I, um, I I usually just refer to them as, as the farm stands because the, the the, your your farmsteads, excuse me, the, the true definition of farmstead is that you have your own animals and you're milking them and then you make your own product with them. Um, and the large majority of our smallest processors, which is 500 pounds or less a day, 54% um, of our Vermont producers are in that window. So we, we have some farms that only have three to six cows, six to 12 goats, and they make their living off of that. And it's very impressive. Yeah. So you could help, you, you can, we can identify those folks, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're on your Absolutely. list. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And will they, will they have losses great enough to capture much money, EB? Um, like we, uh, the little plan that we put together uh, those little guys um, would get, you know, 12, 12 or 13, $14,000. They'd, they'd hit that okay, wouldn't they? Um, it depends on um, how they were selling their product. Um, so I, I spoke with um, Marty Mundy at the Vermont Cheese Council yesterday, and, and she's been working diligently on keeping accurate surveys and data from their, from their constituents. And there's a group that if they predominantly just sold at farmer's markets, um, they had their, their livestock based on coming and freshing and, and making this product for the farmer's market season. And so some of them aren't sure yet how bad their losses are going to be through the summer. For the, any that were selling retail or to restaurants directly, absolutely they will be able to show losses. So some of it really gets into the nitty gritty of what was their market, who were they selling to. Um, but for any of the processors, and I mean, this goes for dairy farms too, um, but in following the CDC guidelines and our governor's orders, I mean, everyone's had to invest in PPE and having to look at um, for some farmstead operations, if they have employees from off the farm, like some processing facilities are running two separate crews. So if that someone becomes sick, they have one crew that can still work. And instead of everyone working at once, now this facility has higher electric bills, higher utility bills, because instead of operating at 12 hours a day, now the electricity and all these things needed to manufacture and process is now at 20 hours a day or more. And so it really depends on how these facilities have addressed what works for them to protect them and their staff from COVID-19. Um, Anthony? It's just to follow up a little bit down that line, it seems like we're talking about two things. One is the increased expense of what you just talked about. The other thing is loss of markets, correct? Yep. I mean, yes. Because I was a little surprised when you said, well, if you're selling to supermarkets and all, you're really going to show loss. Because my assumption had been supermarkets, you'd still be selling to them, whereas farmers markets were closed down for a while. And so, so can you talk a little bit about that? So um, a lot of them depending on what they were selling retail, for our artisan cheese makers, um, the big distribution hub for cheese really goes through New York City. And so a lot of our cheeses to get into different um, artisan cheese shops across the country or a specialty cheese shelf at a supermarket store, um, they lost their way to get distributed when New York City first started with their issues. Um, for those that are selling directly to the farmer's market, our farmer's market season started a week late, basically. Um, and so the actual season and the timing of things with COVID in Vermont, for those selling just locally, 
they may have only missed one week of sales. And what we don't know yet is as the summer continues is if their sales will actually be what they were in the past or if they will be reduced. Sure. Uh, so we're kind of waiting and seeing on that. I mean, because even though farmers markets are open again, I mean, I drove past the farm, went to the farmers market the other last Saturday, and there was not very many people there. Yeah. It was a whole different scene, obviously, yeah. uh, for obvious reasons. And, and but I could see how the sales would not be as great. Plus, they yeah. they've lost a lot of vendors totally, you know, completely. The farmers markets, it's yep. just people are not showing up either as vendors or as customers. Yeah, and that's what we're really concerned about especially as we move through the summer, if we hit the reality that the farmer's markets aren't being visited or the reality, um, one of the difficult things with artisan cheese is that it, it, is, um, it is artwork on your plate and it is amazingly tasty and it does cost more than your, your typical brands, your um, generic brands or things you may get at the store. And with people losing their jobs, or fearful of what will come tomorrow. People are, are pinching pennies and saving, and that's really hurt any of these um, high-end value-added products. People are really watching what they're spending money on, and maybe they used to get a, a delicious aged cheddar or a camembert or a brie, and now, nope, I'm not getting this fancy cheese because I'm worried if, if I will be able to pay my bills next week. And that's one of the <clears throat> things that we're seeing. Seems like a lot of the artisan cheeses, the soft ones particularly, are more um, yep. more likely to spoil. Yep, the soft cheeses have a very strict window aging-wise. When they are ripe, they need to go. And, and even just a few days past that ripening, when you open it as a customer, it's not going to smell the same. The, the texture may not be the same. And so you're... You're, you have a very limited window of when it needs to go, and then when it's bad, it's, it's bad. Um, your aged alpine hard cheeses have a much longer um, shelf life and can age longer. It'll, it could, depending on the cheese, improve the flavor of it. And we do have a fair amount of cheesemakers that are trying to shift um, into making more alpine cheeses right now, um, just so that it can kind of be, it's kind of money put away in the bank. You make the wheel and it can age for six months or it could age for 18 months. And so it's kind of insurance being put away if they have room um, to store it, which is another issue that we're running into of our cheese makers is that if the product isn't moving at the rate they're used to it as, they're running out of room in their caves for aging. Can I, just one more, this is kind of specific, but I've heard that Jasper Hill sold their cows. I'm just wondering, are you familiar with anything bad going on there? Is it just typical of what's going on everywhere? Um, I believe Mateo referenced it as point blankly, it was stop, trying to stop the bleeding. Um, they, their markets, like many others, um, went away overnight and you can't keep producing at the same amount if you don't have the market to sell it to. Right. And so that was a very difficult decision for them to make um, to preserve their business. And so they did yeah. that to cut the volume of cheese that they would be making because of the markets they lost. And it was, that was a, a, a gorgeous registered um, Hereford breed and, and they had to sell them. Yeah, it was there last year heard last that, year, sir. that they could make special cheese from uh, and they couldn't make the cheese any longer because they had no market. So they got rid of their their registered ash years. I, uh, that's what I think I heard. Yes, yeah, the ash years. Uh, so at least uh, by this being held up, I mean we're we're about three or four weeks late. Uh, you know getting uh, getting any help out the door well but it also gives those small guys more time to count their losses so it you know instead of having march april and may now they've got um you know they've got uh well they would have had march april may now they've got march april may and now we're in June, they should have all the expenses from May in. 
So it, it might it might help uh, by having a, a full three months of losses rather than than uh, not being able to count May in. What um, what the agency was was exploring um, as 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 higher ups in our agency are, are trying to figure out just exactly um, we're trying to game plan for how this is going to work with whatever decisions you all make is that one one topic is and I believe this was men mentioned when Steve Collier was was testifying I believe um, last year uh, last week um, was that if people didn't max out on on the payments that that there would be another round later in the summer because we don't know what the summer is going to hold. And so yeah. it was people could turn in their expenses. And if it's not maxed out um, to date, that there would be another potential round, which I think is a great idea um, because we are, we are absolutely in, in my opinion, we're in a survival mode. Like we need to get things out immediately to our dairy industry, but we also don't know what the summer holds. And so there may be, depending on business structures, people that will cap out immediately but there may be others that it will be later in the summer until the issues really start piling up and having that ability to allow people to come back. And if they haven't maxed out on the amount and be able to then receive the rest of it, if they have those losses, I think is a good approach personally. Yeah. Uh, Rose. Yeah. I just want to say, um, you know, we've been working on this for over a month. And so I don't feel like our committee has been dragging our feet. We were waiting to hear from the agency and we just heard from you last week on the- yeah, last, last Wednesday, I think. I yeah, was. so so I just, you know, want to say we've been trying, to, we've been working hard to try to come up with a plan. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that um, your plan or the, not yours personally, but the agency's plan is, is sort of based on what we were working on, at least the dairy part of it. Um, but I also want to, you know, my impression and um, our chair may know more about this, but is that we'll be giving, you know, we'll be appropriating some of the, the, the federal money now and holding on to some of it for later in when we right. come back in right. August, September. Um, to be able to respond to whatever the situation across the board is then. So I think that's one of the reasons why we'll have a smaller uh, pot of money at this time. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see. And if dairy and or whatever is mm -hmm. still in crisis or is in more crisis, then we would have a second crack at the bat um, or the ball or whatever it is. And, um, <laughs> or there may be other industries yep. or other problems that we need to deal with at that point. So I think that's one of the reasons why we're not going to have that full 50 million yeah, agency. That's, that's very accurate, Ruth. And, and uh, you know, we all have bosses in this game. Yep. <laughs> you know, like you have a boss, we yep. have a boss, everybody has bosses. And, uh, and that, that sort of is a plan that if we spend all of our money now and, and there's no money in the fall and we still need money, uh, we're really going to be in trouble. And, uh, you know, the, our folks think that we should hang on to a little of that and have possibly uh, refund this program in the fall to to come back in or to have at least have money to come back with and help out in the fall. But anyways, um, are there other questions for you, B? If Michael, do you have anything that you want to get cleared up or square? No. So I, I guess we're all set and thank you very much uh, for your testimony. It was very good and helpful and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll all um, be able to get something moving here, yeah. you know, either late this week or early next week and preferably late this week, we can get this over to the house and, and move on. Yeah. So with that, uh, thanks again and uh, stay healthy. Yep. Thank you all for your time and, and, and thank you for your service to the state. So. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. So 
anyways, um, uh, we're, um, it's all dumped in our lap to, to get this figured out. Uh, Michael sent out a redraft of, of the bill uh, yesterday, I believe it was. And um, so uh, we could run through those changes, um, but the big issues in, in the draft are all those zeros that we've got to, we've got to fill in. Um, and I've been fooling with those numbers, uh, but uh, you know I haven't I haven't cut them loose to you guys. But we can talk about the numbers and see what what you folks think is after we get to the numbers. And if uh, if any of you have questions, I think Linda's going to put the the draft up on the screen, uh, or if you have your own draft or your own computer, uh, you, uh, you, uh, Michael will run through the changes that he's made uh, from our previous discussion and we'll go from there. Are there any other suggestions uh, from the committee? No, so Michael, uh, uh, we're, I guess ready to go, and um, you've got okay. ch changes. You can tell us where they are. I've got my copy here, and we can kind of follow along. I'll have the copy on the screen in just one moment. Okay. So I'm just going to talk generally about the changes and then go um, kind of section by section. So you had asked that the um, dairy processing, the dairy processors be um, treated the same as the ag producers that were not milk producers. So dairy processors were included in the administration's proposal with milk producers. You asked that the dairy producers, dairy processors be separated out and put with the other ag producers. So. Now there's a section for milk producers and there's a section for ag producers who are not milk farmers, um, dairy processors, custom slaughterhouses, um, not custom, slaughterhouses, commercial processors, and farmers markets. Um, so those are the two big programs now, one for dairy farmers slash milk producers, one for pretty much everyone else. You also asked that the two programs be based on the economic harm concept that the administration had proposed. So I'll be frank, I just stole from the administration that, that language and the concepts that they built around it. Um, so this bill is kind of cooperative theft. Uh, um, so that, that, uh, that's kind of the two big changes in the the milk producer and ag processing section. Well, didn't so, didn't the administration have them separated anyways? They had like forty million for dairy farmers and ten million for the processors. So it was the same program, but different funding amounts for the different types of eligible participants. So now you have, instead of milk producers and dairy processors being in the same program, milk producers are in one program. All other ag producers and processors are in the other program. I wonder, okay. yeah. All right, so if you move down um, on page one, you get to section one. Um, this is that dairy farmer assistance program. Um, the main uh, new definition is on page two, line nine. And that's the definition of economic harm, meaning a milk producer, uh, that really should just say a milk producer's expense, lost revenue, or both related to 2020 COVID-19 public health emergency. 
And so that is what they will be reimbursed for, the, the economic harm that they suffered due to COVID. Um, included now is the definition of goat, goat or sheep dairy farm. You still have the definition of good standing. I don't believe the agency likes this concept, um, but I left it in um, because it was something that you had, as a committee had specifically requested previously. So you can go on to page three. Now, Michael, I'm and, sorry. Yeah, uh, Brian. Michael, do you know what the agency's issue is with the fact that um, they don't like that good standing phrase? I think they believe that all farms are suffering economically, regardless of their compliance with the water quality standards. And they would prefer that all farms uh, be eligible for this program um, and that they will deal with those farms that are not in good standing through um, their general enforcement authority. And as I recall, there were only three farms that were not in good standing? That's correct. Okay. But that it depends, you know, what what do we call good standing or or not good standing? And you know, if it's if it's because they're arguing over uh, a rule or or something that's you know, I can see where you can get in an argument with a regulator, but I would think, I would hope there would have to be very severe before they would classify you as uh, bad standing or not in good standing. Do we, do we under, know anything about that, Michael? So you're, you're uh, correct, Senator Starr, the, the, what constitutes uh, not in good standing is is a very significant um, determination. Uh, it means that there's no active enforcement violation that has reached a violent final order. That means that that basically the that the farm has um, not been complying with an enforcement uh, action by the agency. Um, is not cooperating with the agency, doesn't have a schedule of compliance, et cetera. Uh, and it also means that they're not in compliance with the terms of a current grant agreement or contract with the agency. Um, so when you get your finance or financial assistance from the agency, you're supposed to um, follow those terms of that agreement. Um, and some farms don't do that. Uh, and then the agency has to expend a lot of time and resources to, to try to either get the money back or to get the farm into compliance. So it, it, is, um, it is not just because there's a disagreement about how to go forward with remediation or a remedy. Uh, it's um, significantly down the enforcement path where uh, a farmer is not complying with the agencies. Yeah. Well, I, I got a question mark on that particular item, but we'll, we'll come back to it uh, if, you know, need be. Okay. So you can go to page three, fine 18, subsection B. This is where kind of way Mike, Michael, I'm sorry. Yes. Me? <laughs> It's a little hard to tell who's talking. Anyway, this is Anthony. Um, I just want to be clear that we're talking about giving the support to operating farms. I'm wondering about the farms that went out of business in the last month. Do they are they just out of the picture? Well, right now, one of the, one of the one of the current eligibility requirements is that they're currently um, producing milk. All right, that's what I thought. Yeah. So we're on line 18, Michael? Yep, you're on, you're on page three, line 18. This is where the program's established. It would provide financial assistance to milk producers that have suffered economic harm. So those losses or expenses due to COVID-19 um, in Vermont. And in order to qualify, I just referenced that they had to be currently producing milk. They had to be in good standing. And they have to accurately demonstrate to the secretary economic harm 
that occurred or accrued on or after March 1, 2020 and before December 30th, 2020. I don't really get the December 30th, 2020 date. That's why it's highlighted. Um, there's other provisions in the bill that says uh, basically that all the money needs to be spent by November 1st. Um, and so I, I, I'd want to check with the agency about whether that December 30th date should be changed. Yeah, that, that, there is, that. There is one reason why they might have that in there. And it is because later in the bill, it says if you don't qualify for the maximum award right away, that you can reapply later. Um, but there, there's that November 1st deadline where things have to revert back to the agency for redistribution. And, and I need to get to some clarity with the agency on that language. What line is the November 1st on, Michael? Um, it is uh, several pages into the bill. Oh, okay. It's not uh, where we are then. No, it's on page eight, line eight. Yeah, because, um, yeah. Um, Michael, so, can I ask a question? Uh, yep. uh, it's about the um, economic harm um, and, you know, expenses and revenue losses. They can have revenue loss compared to it. It's the question of compared to what um, and what. It, you can still have a, a business can still lose revenue and make a profit at the same time. And I'm not suggesting that dairy farmers are probably making a profit during all of this, but there are some, uh, for example, this cheese processors, some of them may still be making a profit, the larger ones, because they've ramped up production in other areas, but they still have revenue losses in some areas and expenses in some areas, but over the whole, the net is that they are still um, in the black. So is, the definition doesn't seem to address that potential. And well, the, that's, that's, I was just going to come to that point. Okay. Um, in subdivision C, they have to accurately demonstrate to the secretary economic harm for milk producers. The agency has been discussing setting the context for that being um, the difference between the January milk price, which I believe, and the chair can correct me, but I believe it was about $18 and 25 cents um, versus what they are getting um, currently. So there you have the context for loss for a milk producer. Um, yeah. But that is not currently in the bill. Um, it wasn't in the administration's proposal either, um, but it is something that uh, committee could contemplate for inclusion here. For the next program for the ag producers, dairy processors, custom slaughterhouses, you have that same issue, how to gauge the lost revenue. But the last meeting you had, you said for that program, you didn't want the applicant to to have a net profit from this period. So that, that is a, a condition that's added in to that second program. I don't know how a milk producer would have a net profit. Um, right, and that's what I said. I, th I don't think it's necessarily applicable to the milk right. producers, no. but it is to the other um, section. So I'm glad you've addressed it there. And we may wanna be more specific about what we mean by loss because just also for the you know viewing public that we're not you know providing assistance to businesses that are booming right now <laughs> okay um should i move on yeah so uh for ec economic harm won't be compensable if if the farmer the milk producer um have that loss uh, covered by insurance or other federal grant. Then yeah. you get to the, the administration. It's going to be administered by the agency of ag. The yeah, secretary shall create application forms that, that and it should say milk producers, um, shall utilize when applying for relief. Secretary shall provide awards based on the amount of econ economic harm incurred. 
So it may not be the maximum amount when they first apply. Um, applications shall be processed and um, first come, first serve. Uh, but the secretary needs to determine that the application is administratively complete and includes all required proof of economic harm. And then you come to, as the chair noted, one of the unanswered questions, the dollar amounts, what will be the maximum awards for the various categories of milk producing farms? Um, and you'll see that that is uh, grayed out, highlighted uh, as something for you to uh, review. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if I'm understanding this, Michael, um, we're gonna fill in the zeros at some point and there will be an appropriation. But from my reading of this, the secretary would then be the person that decides who gets what in essence, is that true? Yeah. The secretary will determine whether a milk producer demonstrated a loss or an expense. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the, the milk producer applies in that application. They have to provide all required proof of economic harm, which is loss or expense. And that's what they would that, then get compensated for. Okay. Up, to, up to the maximum amount that you set um, under subsection D. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I, I guess we can go through the bill and then we'll come back and play, you know, try to figure out these numbers so they're equitable and, and fair and against what we've got to spend, what we have to spend, rather. Yeah, so you want to continue, Michael? Sure, sure. So the, the maximum grant is going to be based upon the farm type known to the secretary as of March 1st, 2020. Um, so if you were a medium farm on March 1st, you qualify as a, for that, that maximum amount. If you were a small farm, you qualify for that amount. Um, then you get some just basically the processing issues. Um, once the milk producer completes the application, demonstrates the economic harm, secretary promptly issues the payment. Um, there's a condition here. If there is only a certain amount of funds and there's a significant demand because of the economic loss, um, the secretary has the right to only pay up to out what, what he or she has to expend. Um, and then whenever a milk producer has not demonstrated economic harm, this is the ability for them to put in an addendum to say, well, they haven't demonstrated the maximum amount of economic harm. They then um, issue an addendum that will allow them to come back at a later time to show additional economic harm and to get a further payment if funds are available. Um, well, I'm wondering, I'm wondering in there if if there should be some way that the secretary could transfer funds, say, because it's all going to be in one kitty. But if if there's farms that haven't received anything and there's still some money left in the law lower categories or wherever, uh, why the secretary can't expend all those funds um, in a, a fashion where everybody would get some money. So I mean, uh, is there any way to word something like that so that, that we aren't sitting on a few million dollars and some people haven't gotten their money. I didn't think we had put the money in buckets. I thought we just sort of capped the words in buckets, if that makes sense. So at, at the end, if there's still money in, in the big bucket in a farm in September has lost a can show additional loss, they could reapply toward getting some of that money that's still left in the bucket. So on page eight, uh, line seven, subsection B, um, 
there's already a provision for unexpended funds. Um, if any funds are not expended by November 1st, 2020, they revert to the agency of ag for ongoing financial assistance to farmers who can demonstrate economic harm incurred from March 1, 2020 through December 30th, 2020. That's that December 30th date I was talking about in the beginning. That's the only reason that I can see why December 30th is included in the definition of economic harm. And I just need to clarify that with the agency. So there's already a provision that if something's unexpended, um, then the agency is be going to be able to, to use that to, to go out to those farmers that demonstrate economic harm. Well, that date should be moved up because I think the legislature, from what I've heard, um, as of December 30th or prior to, just prior to that, if there's any um, COVID money left, it's going to get transferred into the UI account, which is permissible to do so we don't lose any of this federal money. I, right, so, I don't so that, that, that is why I want to talk to the agency about why they have December 30th. I don't know how a farm's going to show that loss on December 28th. Um, no. Right, and, and, and so if you move that date back as you were referencing, Chair, I think you give that farm the ability to show real economic harm and not jeopardize the state losing that money, reverting it back to the treasury or, or losing the ability to put it into UI. Um, so I, I, I think ultimately there's probably going to be a, a clause in one of these bills that said any unexpended CARES Act money is going to go into UI. Yes. Uh, so... Um, that's why I need to talk to the agency. You need to be really careful about that date um, to make the money available. Um, yeah, I would think December 1st would be about as, or November 30th, uh, they should have to have that all in so we're sure that the money's going to get, you know, because they're going to have to paw over the applications and, and any of that. So, yeah, you, the committee, you think we should back that up or let Michael talk with the secretary? Uh, what's your pleasure? Uh, Brian? Thank you, Bob. Well, uh, if the secretary had a specific reason, maybe he should talk to the secretary. Otherwise, I agree, you can't, you're not gonna be able to turn around that money in 24 or 48 hours. It just, it doesn't make any sense. But maybe there's another reason that we don't know of. I don't know. Yeah. So go ahead and check with Anson or Steve, um, Michael, and and if you need, you know, if we need, just move that date back to, you know, the first of December or November thirtieth or some logical date so that they can manage to get the money out. And then we still have time to transfer the money uh, to wh wh a safe place. Okay. Well, Steve just emailed me and said he was using the December 30th date to track the language in the, in the CARES Act um, about having it be spent by, by 12, by December 30th. I still, I still think you're going to have that issue of it being spent because it has to be spent yeah. by the recipient um, as well as by the state. So, well, also, uh, um, can I just, uh, the, uh, given that we're going to have less money in this program than the 40 million that, or we're likely going to have less than the 40 million, I think it's going to just be spent. Like, I, yeah. I it's going to be going like hotcakes and be done by September 1st if we get this bill passed in the next few weeks because the, uh, it's not going to none of the pain involved will probably match what what the quote unquote economic harm is because there's just not we just don't have enough money to to do that so 
I, I'm not as concerned. I think it's going to be spent, but, but I do think we should move the dates sooner to give more flexibility. And then I would assume there's some kind of consistent language that we'll be putting in every single money bill to say that if it's not expended by this uh, time that reverts to the UI fund. Right. And I, I need to, I'm, I haven't talked to Damien or Steve Prine about what that date's going to be. And it may just be, you move the date until that date, um, yeah. that it all has to be spent prior to that, that time frame so that no money is lost to UI. Yeah. So you'll check that out and we'll go from there. Okay. Oh, we'll do. We'll and I, I'm not, I'm not, criticizing the agency for using that data i understand now um i just wanted to raise it because i knew some of the timing issues were going to be with the ui provision it was going to be a little difficult yeah um should i move on sure um so i think that really brings you um to page seven line eight and this is the question about what penalty would you want to assess to a person who submits false or misleading information? In your original draft bills, you were assessing an administrative penalty to be assessed by the secretary under their general uh, administrative penalty authority, which is um, $1,000 for discrete offenses and up to fifteen or $20,000 total. Um, the agency in their proposal um, wants to be able to issue uh, civil administrative and or criminal enforcement under the Agency of Agriculture's authority or under criminal authority in Title 13. Um, and that's, that's the first question for you. Do you want criminal enforcement for um, false information that's provided in this application? Um, and then there's what, if you do, if you want that criminal, um, that's about what should it be. Um, there's an imprisonment provision in here. I don't know if you want imprisonment, but these are all questions that um, I don't think you've addressed before. Well, and is this the agency's language that just came up on the screen? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know why we need to, um, I mean, it sounds pretty harsh, but there, there are going to be some large payments paid out. Well, that's, um, what, that's what I was just going to say. One of the rationales is that you have potential fraud that otherwise would be criminal um, in the state because of the amount. Yeah. And, and does this limit that to the larger amounts or no it uh, does not can is there some way to do that so that the penalty would would follow say the size of the infraction well i i, I need this the title 13 provisions are, and what could what uh, a producer could be prosecuted for will depend on the specific terms and conditions of, of those crimes. And some of those crimes are based on dollar amount value. So to an extent you already have, you already have a thresholds built in and the default thresholds in title 13. Um, but otherwise, no, there's no, if it's over $50,000, fraudulent application it's a crime if it's under it's still uh, civil or administrative that, that, that is not in here right well what do you guys think should we put that in there uh, brian i would just hate to have a small farm make a mistake in an application not maliciously and then we're throwing them in jail I, just, well, there, there, there is, there is a, a mens rea requirement. It has to be that they willfully, knowingly, or recklessly submitted the false information. Yeah, I'm, uh, we, have, we have an awful lot of lawyers um, around, though, Michael, that are looking for work. 
Well, I think that, I mean, I, I agree with Senator Collimore that it, it seems a little excessive to me. Um, I, I think uh, admin, I'm comfortable with an administrative penalty if they don't do it. At, but And Michael, you said that under Title 13, there may be just sort of a blanket thing anyway that is applicable. Is that true? That's applicable anyway without us having to... No, it's the, the blanket's <laughs> under Title 6. And that that's the agency's general administrative enforcement authority. Um, and, under Title 13, there are crimes. That's that's where all the crimes are defined. Right, that's what I mean. But so if you're, isn't there a, a crime for willingly, willfully, knowingly, and recklessly submitting false information to the state that's just? Uh, that That is, yes, there there is. But what you're saying here is what the penalty will be. If you just say that the penalty for providing false or misleading information is an administrative penalty, then you basically said that the Title 13 provisions don't apply. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Well, I also think this underscores why we would want to include the in good standing language in our bill. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that the agency put this in, but then is uncomfortable with the in good standing, I think. Um, but uh, I don't well, know. Good, st good standing. You, you won't even get to an application, right? You won't have the ability to provide false or misleading information if you're not in good standing. Right, right. That's why I think we should have it in our bill. We should, they should have to be in good standing to even be able to apply. Um, but I, I don't know, this seems a little harsh, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it's pretty, pretty stiff, but if you're going to give, you know, somebody a hundred grand, or 125 grand um, and they're, you know, they're up against the wall with no money, no food, uh, cows that need to be fed. They might put something a little misleading in their application. I don't know, but um, I would hope not. But, it, you know, they're hurrying and, well, we'll throw this in and that'll help bring the thing up. Uh, but I like that, you know, that imprisonment and all that stuff. You know. Well, I, I, I again, I, I don't really want to criticize the agency here. I think they probably just took that five-year um, provision from from a Title Thirteen crime. Um, but that that kind of speaks to a larger issue that the judiciary committees have been looking at the penalty awards or. or requirements and statute are, are very inconsistent. Um, and the, the example I use is that um, involuntary manslaughter has a, a maximum imprisonment of, of two to three years. Yeah. Whereas if you impede a livestock inspector, you're subject to the same penalties for homicide, which is life imprisonment. So yes. you, you've got some significant disparities in penalty amounts um, throughout the statute. Um, and one of the things that the Judiciary Committees have been talking about is like breaking down um, penalties based on either amounts or severity, previous convictions. Um, so, so you have opportunity here. And it's something that you hadn't talked about. And I just wanted to put it in front of you because the agency has a has a different proposal and I just wanted you to be aware of it. Yeah, well, maybe um, maybe you should have a conversation with Steve. Okay. And try to get this down so it makes sense. So it, the, the penalties fit the crime and, and not just, um, you know, Okay. Okay. Could I just ask, maybe, Mr. Chair? Yeah. Uh, uh, so you're not on the screen, now, Chris. Oh, but I am. Okay. Um, Michael, th this surely is coming up for other business grant programs and and generally around our CARES money getting out the door. 
And so it would seem to me logical that we don't have each committee coming up with their own penalty, you know, provisions. Now, potentially the ag grants are a bit bigger than restaurant grants or whatever, but we ought to have some consistent framework. And so I'm wondering um, if we could ask you, Michael, to check in with others who are helping economic development and others, and maybe we would do the same at a chair's meeting or something. It just strikes me we ought to have a consistent approach here. Sure. And, and there, there are large grants and some of the other, the restart grant is, I think it's up to $250,000. So um, I think that's, it's a good point. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Okay, should I move on? Yeah. Um, so that basically brings you to the end of the program. And then you get the appropriation. Uh, I, I can't remember who referenced that, that the, the money pot was the same, but the word pot was different. Um, actually, the way that the, the pots are set up in, in the draft in front of you, the, the money pot is separate too. There's two separate appropriations for the two separate programs. There would be whatever amount you appropriate for the milk producer program. We already talked about the reversion language. Um, and so that would be section two is what appropriation you want for the milk producer assistance program. Um, what uh, page is that, Michael? Page eight, line one. Oh. So this, this is your total appropriation for the milk producer program. Um, I think, I think we're going to have to put a number in there and, um, I don't know if we can make it work out, but the, the number, the number I've fooled with is for the dairy part of this and the farm part is 21,793. 750. 21,793,750. That's a oddly specific number. How did you come to that? You want to round it up or down? <laughs> <laughs> I work the numbers backwards in. Okay, okay, that's what I want. So you start out with, you know, trying to be fair to the farmers and, and so they, you know, so we get the right amount to the right groups or somewhat. And, and then you multiply it all out separately by the numbers and that I don't know if that number is going to be good or not, but we can leave that open and come back to it once we get to playing, you know, figuring the numbers. You want to do that? Yeah, Bobby, did you get a, a total number from Jane or whomever uh, for yeah. the ag package that, we're, that we have, plus yeah. hopefully a separate number for the food security? Yeah, you were... You were right with your projected number earlier. The 30. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So I have a breakdown too, but um, that I've been fooling with for the different programs, but maybe we can go through the full bill and then talk about the numbers. And then back up. Yeah. Yeah. I like your number, Mr. Chair. Well, let's just leave that one in there for a minute. <laughs> that, was, that was good well, math. You leave it there, but I've got it. I've got it pretty secure. Okay. <laughs> I want to know how many how many pennies out of the one point two five billion that is. Uh, that would be um, <laughs> twenty one. Would be twenty one dollars. <laughs> if you've got twelve hundred and fifty million, and we're 
taking 21, um, or if you take the full amount, it's 30 bucks out of the total amount. So we aren't getting that. We aren't getting a lot. I'll tell you, it sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, the governor at least gave us fifty dollars. Okay, should I move on? Yes. So if Before you move down, double. <laughs> if you move down on page eight, line twelve, this is now the Ag Producer Processor Assistance Program. It had previously just been about those agriculture producers that were not milk producers, but it now includes. Um, Commercial processors, you'll see that on page eight, line 18. Those are people who process livestock or poultry products for um, commercial use. It okay. also includes, on page nine, it includes commercial slaughterhouses. Um, it includes dairy processors, which the administration had um, combined with the milk producers. It has that definition of economic harm. We already discussed how are you gonna gauge loss for dairy processors and commercial slaughterhouses because you don't have that, that federally set milk price like the milk producers do. You have a, a broad definition of eligible applicant that brings in all of the different eligible uh, entities under a universal um, definition. Wait, Michael? Yeah, Yep. Uh, that your economic harm definition on lines 11 through 13. Yeah, it's got like, milk producer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, then you have a definition of farmer's market. And uh, someone asked last week how many farmer's markets there are. I asked the agency if they register farmer's markets. They don't. Um, there is a farmer's market association that NOFA runs. NOFA lists about 55 people, 55 events um, or, or markets, but there's some duplication there, say a summer market versus a winter market. So I would say the number is between 50 and 60. Then you have that definition of good standing and whether or not you want it to apply to this program as well. And then you have the establishment of the program um, so it would provide eligible applicants. So agriculture producers that aren't milk producers, dairy processors, commercial slaughterhouses, commercial processors, the farmers markets, a direct relief grant payment to offset economic harm occurred to occurred due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. You have that they have to be currently operating. They have to be in good standing. And they have to accurately demonstrate to the secretary economic harm that occurred between March 1st, 2020 and December 30th, 2020. Again, that December 30th, 2020 date should change. Yeah, that. Um, the key difference for this program is on page 11, nine through 11. The eligible applicant shall not receive an award under the section if the applicant had a net business profit between March 1st, 2020 and July 1, 2020. I didn't know when to send the, set the, the back end date, you know, the, the, that July date. Should it be later in the summer? Should it be before the applicant? I don't know when you want to send, set that, that, that end date for when they have to show an economic harm. So that, so that, you even if if you leave this date in, uh, usually uh, you know, say the end of June, you aren't going to really get everything tallied up until probably mid July for the first six months, say. Um, so I, I don't know. You could move that out a little further. I would think. So I, I wanted to flag it for you. I use July 1 because it's a fiscal year date, but I, I wanted to flag that I don't really know what the appropriate end date is for that period. Well, <clears throat> I'd move that out to September. So 
uh, the one thing about moving it to September, I, I agree. I think it should be moved, but that also would imply that these guys couldn't get their money until in the fall, which may be problematic for them because you can always say, well, you didn't have a profit for the first three months, but you might have a profit, a huge profit on the back end, and then it would compensate you for your losses. So it's tricky because we want them to be able to get this money on the sooner side. Um, well, we're yeah. already though part way through June now. <clears throat> Move it to August. Or yeah, maybe August first is a good the end of July. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Michael, I did want to ask you that you have. Um, in on, on page 11 lines, I think it's four and five. Economic harm is not compensable under this section if the same expenses have been or will be covered by insurance or another federal grant. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that same language in the the dairy farmer part of it? It is. Yeah. It is. Okay, great. Thanks. Um <laughs> Then you get to administration. It's it's largely the same, if not exactly the same, as what you had for the milk producers. Um, then on page 12, you get to the maximum award. Uh, remember when you were, were talking about the administration proposal for dairy processors, it was based on the amount of of uh, milk that they processed, which was um, synced to their milk handler, their their um, yeah their milk handler license. Uh, you don't really have that kind of breakdown for commercial slaughterhouses, commercial processors, farmers markets, etc. So I don't know how you want to set the maximum award under this program. Um, so, yeah, but the, what the administration have in there, did they even take that into consideration? Well, remember the administration only had dairy processors getting the award they, and they had it based on poundage of milk processed, which was effectively what their milk handler license is, the, the license fee is based on. You, yeah, you, don't right. have a, you don't have a similar framework no. to work off of for, for the other eligible applicants. No, because there's, uh, besides slaughter, there's others. Um, uh, right, I, there, there is some frameworks for the, for the ag producers who are not milk producers, um, and I can get that to you. The agency has some of that, but it's it's not there for, to my knowledge, for commercial slaughterhouses and commercial processors. But Mr. Chair, yeah. I, I wonder if we could ask Michael, the, the, all of the, the dollar amount decisions flow from one another. And so I, I wonder if we could just, get them on one page, you know, just under the headline of what they are. And, and that way, when we turn, once we, once we have sort of settled on the arenas we want to address, we could just back, go back and fill in numbers, you know, to, to we, cause we have sort of, we have, uh, as, as I think it, we have our overall number now, we, we're working with 30 million, we have buckets, and then within the buckets, we wanna say how much is the maximum grant. And even in there, there's some subcategories. So it, it's tricky as we keep running into these blanks to think about them uh, individually. And I, it would help me if we could turn our attention when we want, when we get there, when we have the framework, then we, would all at once fill in all of the numbers. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but. Well, you know, if you want to talk about slaughter facilities, you know, I've been 
fooling around with the beef stuff and they're out their out anywhere from three to six months on getting a date when you can take your animal in to be uh, to be slaughtered. Um, you know, I I really wonder about if they've even had any type of a loss. I think it's great to have them in here in case they have, but uh, even the little guys the that are doing just a few animals are out, you know, months uh, for hogs and, and chickens and the whole nine yards. Uh, they've been crazy busy. But anyways. Um, Wait, Bobby? Well, we, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's so hard to see you all in these tiny little boxes, um, but... Um, <laughs> Well, uh, you're not on the screen now, but Chris is. <laughs> yeah, he bumped me. Um, <laughs> well, I, I agree. I think that probably some of the slaughterhouses are doing better than they have ever been doing. Um, but some of the beef producers are not doing as well. I talked to one who had, you know, a loss in April of uh, almost thirty thousand dollar loss. So he's a beef producer. So, and part of it is because he can't get his animals to the facilities because they're all. Um, they're all full, but I'm wondering, I, I think Chris is right. Having it all in one place would be helpful. And Bobby, it sounds like you've done, a, you've worked some numbers and I'm happy to work some numbers. And maybe if each of us puts together a little table, then we can compare notes tomorrow. When we meet. I'm happy to do that and send it out and say, Hey, this could work. Um, I love messing around with numbers, but I also wonder after, um, EB's testimony and also the complications with putting everybody in the same bucket um, if we might want to have a separate program for dairy processors and then we could base it out on the amount of milk processed and then a separate program for non-dairy everybody else um, that is based on different criteria um, for amounts. Um, just throwing well, that out there. I know it makes more work for people to accept another thing. And then we have three programs instead of two programs. But um, I do think having the slaughter facilities in there and other farmers in there just in case they have losses is really helpful because there may be facilities that had significant expenses that they didn't get covered too. So um, anyway, just throwing that out there. Well, it would be good if if we had numbers, uh, you know, wherever they are, whatever they are to, you know, and, and figure it all out at the same time. Uh, I think that way we could be equitable to, to an extent if we see them all on the same, same page. Anybody want to talk on my phone? <laughs> No, I kind of do. <laughs> Boy. Um, so anyways, um, if you want to, any of you want to fool with the different numbers or the different categories, um, we will keep working through the bill and, and then we'll have a, try to get them to Michael or somewhere where we can analyze them all at the same time. But, but I, I can put together that one pager. It, it won't won't be hard. Okay. Um, good. Yeah, I, think, I, think it, I think it would be good to see those numbers all on one page to be able to take a look at them. And I'm a little, the idea of pulling the, process, the dairy processors out and keeping them in separately is not necessarily a bad idea. I don't want us to fall down the path of giving people awarding grants based on how big they are, though. You know, because you process more milk, you're going to get more money. I'd rather see us make sure that we maintain a focus on some of the smaller processors, as tricky as that may be. That's my biggest concern is that those smaller guys actually get the support they need to keep going. Yeah, I agree, Anthony. And I, I think we should weight it toward the small end for sure and put a cap on the large end, at least that's right. my feeling. Okay, so you want to fool with that one pager, Michael? Sure. So my one question is you have gotten specific 
funding requests from some of the programs or projects in here. Um, for example, BATB said they need $192,000 for um, the viability um, that they would be, viability services they would be providing. Do you want that on the one pager as well? Do you want everything on the one pager, just the things well, you need to make decisions you. about? I think if we're going to keep track of all the beans, uh, it should be on the page. Yeah. All right. We'll do it. Yeah, I agree. But I, okay. I think we're being shortchanged with, with the overall number, personally. You know, I think the 30 is a little low. Yeah, the, the challenge is we, I think, agree that it's smart to hold some of the money back in case you know, it's hard to predict what September looks like, and it's hard to predict whether or not the feds will let us use money to to help with school funding yeah. and stuff like that. And, and you can't have you can't have it all, sadly. No, we can't spend it all now. That wouldn't be wise at all. And um, so, but I don't want to do more. I don't want to have to retain more from ag than the other parts of state government are retaining from their sections. But anyways, let's move on. Okay, I think the, the language about processing applications and assistance payments and, and the penalty provisions, they're, they're all the similar, if not the same for the the milk producers. So you can skip over them. The issues that you've identified for the milk producers are the same for yeah. this language. That brings you to page 14, section four. This is just what appropriation amount you want to have for the ag producer and processor program. Um, that will go on the one pager. Uh, then you come to the farm worker retention program. Um, the, I want to bring up for you uh, an issue that came up in U.S. Treasury issued a frequently um, asked question document last week, uh, and it may uh, it may influence your decision. They issued it on May twenty eighth. Yeah, um, that's a little shaky to do, I think. So there were questions that were posed to Treasury about whether or not there could be payroll benefits programs. Um, and generally they said no, that that workforce bonuses are not allowed, but hazard pay may be allowed. And they just said that hazard pay means additional pay for performing hazardous duty or work involving physical hardship and each case that is related to COVID-19. And then they further said that the employee must have substantially dedicated to mitigating or responding to the COVID-19 public health emergency. So I am not sure that the way that I have drafted this program right now meets those criteria. It's going to be a stretch of the imagination, I would think, unless you can, unless you can rewrite our, you know, this section to, to fill in there because, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be hard to cover. Um, they say they did say that hazard pay was okay. I was reading through the FAQs that you sent out and yeah, it, misread it's it. on page six. The question is the guidance includes workforce bonuses as an example of ineligible expenses, but provides that hazard pay would be eligible if otherwise determined to be a necessary expense. Is there a specific definition of hazard pay? Uh, it says hazard pay means additional pay for performing hazardous duty or work involving physical hardship in each case that is related to COVID-19. So, so that, that would cover our, our essential workers bill. That would answer that question. 
that the house is all debating right now, but it. I, I, I don't know that bill well enough to answer that question, but potentially. And then it also could potentially the food service workers bill or provision that we were talking about for the school food service workers, if we were to do something like that, because they were directly responding to. COVID. Yes. And, and I, I would go to page seven of the frequently asked question document where the question was, may payments from the fund be used to cover across the board hazard pay for employees working during a state emergency? And the answer was no. The guidance says that funding may be used to meet payroll expenses for public safety, public health, public health care, human services, and similar employees whose services are substantially dedicated to mitigating or responding to the COVID-19 public health emergency. I think food service employees fit underneath that. Yeah. I think those school workers were substantially dedicated to make, mitigating or responding to the public from COVID-19. So I, I think the school nutrition workers have a better argument that they qualify for hazard pay, especially since the demand for their program and the demand on their time and what they had to do in response was different from their everyday duties. Right. But they didn't work. They didn't work with children all. I mean, I don't know about in other towns, but you know, our food service people worked in the kitchen with with their normal employees uh, that they'd been working with, making you know their their bag meals to ship on the school bus. Uh, they didn't even go to the houses with the food. They had boxes, little cooler boxes, usually by a mailbox or. Uh, set it on the porch or something. So they didn't, even the ones that delivered it didn't have direct contact with, with people. Uh, they were responding directly to the COVID crisis and doing a job that was different. And in, in a lot of school districts, they used paraprofessionals, not just the regular food service workers to add, because they needed to add capacity to both deliver and package and prepare the food. But I mean, this is a tangent, but I, it does seem to me that the guidance would cover them. But I understand that the way that this farm worker thing is drafted right now, it would not fit into that box. Michael. And that if we were to do it, we would have to use general fund money. Yeah. I think that that would probably be your safest alternative uh, to use general fund money. Yeah, well, we'd probably get shot as a committee <laughs> if we suggested that. We aren't getting hazardous pay to go before the squad. <laughs> Chris, you had a question? Well, I wonder if, uh, Mike, I, I, look, it's not worth printing um a document that calls on general fund dollars. It's just not, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to set our friends up for disappointment down the, the hall. I really don't. It doesn't seem genuine to me. So general dollars, I mean, if people want to do that, we can talk about it, but I does not seem like a smart strategy. No. I wonder, Michael, if farm workers had to take on extra hours because not everybody could work because of health risks, et cetera. Would that be a way of maybe not covering the whole universe, but um, better, you know, giving us a shot at, at federal dollars? Um, I, I can, I can think about that. There's also a, a little subgroup of ledge council and JFO employees that are looking at at these questions when they come up and kind of opining whether or not they think they're um, qualifying or not I can I could put that in front of them as well hey, did you guys want to take a five minute break and
we'll just leave everything on like it is and we'll just uh, take a five minute break to get water or whatever and come back. Uh, that's fine with me. I do have to jump off at 1130. I, the pro tem has called me into a meeting. So just an FYI. Yeah, well, tell him we're getting short change. I'd be uh, glad to. And it, uh, <laughs> expect he'll hear that from uh, a few of us. Do I take five, you guys? Or... Yeah, Brian. That's also fun to remind you. Brian and I both have another meeting to go to at noon. At what time? Oh, I forgot we about to, that. We have to yes. be in another meeting at before, well, before noon. Well, maybe we should just go for the next 15 minutes and then just end early or something. If well, I got to see a man about a horse. Oh, sorry, Brian. <laughs> Are you okay. buying or selling? <laughs> <laughs> okay, five minutes. Okay. Michael, can I ask you a question? Sure. Was the original amount in this farm worker section 500,000? I noticed it it's was. not 600. Huh? It was. So originally there was um, the, the way that the eligibility was set up, it would have, it would have been a little bit um, a smaller group. But now okay. with, with farm worker retention, and it being anyone that didn't qualify for um, CARES Act stimulus, that would bring in people like dependents, like 18, 19 year old adults that were living at home. They didn't qualify for CARES Act. So um, we thought that the, the appropriation might need to be expanded a little bit to, to deal with that. Yeah, I was just trying to remember, I thought it was originally $100,000 less. Yeah, it was. Okay, thank you. Which section was that, Brian? The migrant workers. It originally was five hundred thousand, and now I see in the bill the revision here at six hundred. So Michael yeah. was just explaining why it went up by a hundred. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do them anyways, but. Yeah. It was just a question. Yeah. Yeah. The. Um, so you guys have got another meeting at noon? We do. There's an amendment on the floor that's coming up this afternoon, and they wanted to uh, have the Government Operations Committee look at it first. Yeah. The, um, the, you were kind of outnumbered in the committee uh, on that thing yesterday. Well, that's a familiar position for me, Bobby. <laughs> well, I mean, I fooled around with elections since I was 21 years old and I was the moderator. Yeah. And boy, I'm skeptical of that sending votes out. And no, I mean, when my, when my brother told me his wife had been dead for over a year, uh, well, it was the second year, and when the ballots came down there in Florida, there was Linda right on with, she got her ballots right along with his, and I mean, that's not good. Yeah. Uh, anyways, um, that's, a, that's another battle, another story. And um, we'll see if it works out well or not. Yeah. We'll know that's, where, that's where Anthony and I have to go at noon. Yeah. Their well, uh, yeah, their GovOps, yeah. Uh, Ruth should be, are you with us, Ruth? Um, well, we can get started, uh, Michael, uh, where we left off, and we're on what, page 15. I, I think you can skip to page 21 if you want to skip over the farm worker retention program. Well, that's um, 
good. Uh, we'll tell Ruth that missing, uh, being absent didn't help her cause. Um, so that takes you to page 21, line 18, section 7. Yeah. And uh, you had had in your bill, you wanted uh, occupational safety information available to farms. Uh, you wanted the Secretary of Agriculture to produce it. The Secretary of Agriculture said that BOSHA already produces that information. So this section now requires the Secretary of Ag after consultation with BOSHA and the Department of Labor to post on the Agency of Ag's website educational material um, related, uh, available from BOSHA, uh, related to farm worker health and safety, including BOSHA's recommended best practices for preventative measures um, to address the threat to health and safety posed by COVID-19. And then the Secretary of Ag shall post the English and Spanish language versions, which apparently BOSHA has, uh, and then provide links or references on how to obtain the material from BOSHA in other languages. And there's so no appropriation I, needed for that, correct? Uh, it, it just basically would use part of the service time of a full-time employee at the Agency of Agriculture. I think that could be assumed into the agency's budget. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, should I move on? Yeah. Section eight is an appropriation to VHCB, $192,000 from the Coronavirus Relief Fund to provide business, financial, and mental health assistance to farmers who suffered losses or expenses due to business interruptions caused by COVID-19 public health emergency. Consulting shall include information and assistance with accessing federal and state COVID relief funds access to additional markets, diversification of income streams, access to mental health services, and other assistance farmers may require to address or recover from business interruption caused by the COVID-19 public health emergency. Yeah. I ran that language by <clears throat> Ella that, and Jen. That language is fine. Now we'll just have that 192 on our list. Of, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, then that brings you to section nine, which is <coughs> the meals on wheels section. So you wanted to um, provide some additional appropriation to meals on wheels to meet the additional demand or cost uh, that they were experiencing and getting uh, food assistance to vulnerable populations. So this would provide in addition to any other funds that are appropriated to Dale in fiscal year 2021 for providing nutritious nutrition services to older Vermonters or other vulnerable population. <clears throat> the dollar amount from the coronavirus relief fund to Dale for distribution to the area agencies on aging. And those that's the entity that, that coordinates Meals on Wheels and provides services for use prior to December 30th to pay for expenses incurred in delivering food to older Vermonters and other vulnerable populations in compliance with public health or social distancing requirements implemented in, in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. But that particular section, um, I mean, that should be coming out of health and welfare's portion of COVID money and going to Dale, I would think, and I don't, I don't know where we came up with that to put it into our ag bill, but I I think that with us being limited with funds, I think I mean I haven't got I haven't got strong feelings about keeping this in the bill. I agree. Well, I I can't remember who it was. I think it may have been Senator Hardy when when this was discussed. She said that you should be clear with the appropriations committee or leadership that this shouldn't come out of the ag bucket, that this should come out of, of um, another bucket. Uh, and that, that's, that's what I believe what she said. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. I, I was, I was under the impression that we were going to do two bills. Sorry, Chris. I, okay. that we were going to do two bills. One was going to be the ag relief bill and one was going to be food 
security bill and that the food security bill would not be part of the 30 million or whatever we get for ag, but it would be shared among a bunch of committees, the health and welfare, education, economic development, and we would sort of all be on board with wanting to provide funding for food security. So um, recall, I spoke to Senator Lyons about this and um, she was glad to hear that we were gonna give it a start. And we all thought that it was important to have a food, a bunch of the food related stuff in one place, whether or not it's in this bill, I, I don't have strong feelings, but for sure it should not come out of the 30 million. I mean, I think- Yeah, that- we We're should. all saying that. So I don't know where we get that. I don't know if that means it shouldn't be in this bill or, or if you wanna, work through appropriations or or with center alliance directly we could also just send her this language what i told her was we were looking into it we didn't want to step on toes but we wanted to make sure that this was thought through and she was grateful and we just kind of agreed to talk again so tell me what yeah. to do but i think it not come out of the 30 million clearly I think she's going to be putting together um, some health care stuff. And, and yeah, this should get, she should deal with this, I think. Yeah, I say send it over to health and welfare. Well, I, would, I don't mind sending it over to health and welfare, but I agree that, and I certainly agree it shouldn't come out of the 30 million we're talking about. I just want to really make sure that it does happen. It doesn't get lost yeah. in the shuffle somewhere. I mean, obviously, access to food is a big, big, big part of the problem we're facing. And it is part of the agricultural system. I understand why it shouldn't be in this bill, but I think that behooves us to make sure that it happens somewhere. Yeah, I agree. And there was also the piece on the, the school food um, yeah. meals that was similar, you know, that we were going to have it all in one place. So there was a basically a food bill. Um, but but it yeah. crossed a bunch of committees. Yeah, that's the next uh, section, I think. So, Michael, we'll we'll hold this up and and we'll make arrangements sometime along to ship this to health and welfare. Okay, and let's leave let's leave it in here now because we're all agreeing that we want to make sure it happens. Does that sound fair? But but um, you know, explore how either we get money in or we ship these sections out. Yes. Okay. Should I move on? Yeah. Well, Linda, could you post the other language that I sent this morning? So uh, remember when I told you I was gonna draft the school nutrition language i said i was just going to take a shot at it but i would need to talk to rosie um i didn't talk to rosie until either monday or um late monday and so she recommended that i um rework some of these proposals uh, and that's what i did um and so for the summer meals program she indicated that I don't need to create this whole big new grant program like I did in the, the original bill, um, that I really just need to increase the money that's appropriated uh, to the Agency of Education for distribution to summer meal sponsors to assist in the payment of costs that, they are, that are incurred in order to comply with COVID-19 public health precautions or to accommodate increased participation in the program due to COVID. So no big crazy grant program necessary for summer meals, just an additional appropriation to address those additional costs. Um, and then uh, going on into section of uh, the new section 11, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I, I emailed it to all of you. Michael, does it say alternative nutrition programs? It's on now. Alternative school. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So uh, this, yeah. this, this just falls into, to me, a similar bucket of, is this coming out of our, our 30 million or not? I, 
I would hope not, but we want to also make sure it happens. So uh, I okay. guess it's on the same list. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Senator Hardy or Senator Starr. Well, it, I don't know where does that money come from at the present time? Does it come out of, it doesn't come out of the ag agency's budget, I don't believe. No, it's the agency of ed. Yeah, and Ruth, have you guys talked at all about this in education? But I, what I told education, similar to what the conversation Chris had with Ginny, I told my committee that we were working on something and that once I had language, I would share it with them. I, I still think we should just do a separate bill that includes all the food stuff. And then we can have each committee that's reg that has a piece of it take a look at that bill, but that we have, you know, then we have four committees who are all committed to making sure this food stuff goes forward. And it wouldn't be taken out of ag, it wouldn't be taken out of anybody's pot, it would be a food pot. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm not, I don't get to make these decisions, but that's what I would do. Um, and then we're all on board with it and all have a sort of reason to want to see it go forward. The, the, yeah. you, I guess the only pushback I'd offer is more bills means more chance for problems. So if we can get the money from other pots into this bill, then there's some wisdom to pushing it all at once, but that, you know, I'm not picky about it. It's just, we're, we're struggling to see bills advance at some level. So uh, particularly the house is struggling because of their numbers to just function. So uh, I, I think there is an argument uh, for having it all in one bill. Okay. That's fair. I defer to you as long as we just make sure it happens. And I think put piecing it out might be make, make it less viable. Well, the only thing is uh, we're, we're stuck with, as far as I know, the 30 million and, and every million that we give away to, you know, don't use for dairy and processing. And, and that is a, you know, money that we don't have to deal with. Brian? Thank you, Bobby. I guess I'm going the other way on this. Um, I mean, I think, I think we all agree that both the school program and the Meals on Wheels is a good uh, thing to do. But I've learned over the years, mostly from the chair of this committee, that if you have two committees that are both solidly behind something, you have a better chance of pushing it to the finish line. So I would be hopeful that the Senate um, Committee on um, Health and Welfare would take the Meals on Wheels part, knowing that the five of us would support whatever they have in their bill, because it would include that. And the same thing here, if, uh, if the uh, Education Committee is going to advance anything legislatively, I would put the Summer Meals Program in their bill and again, Senator Bruth would know at that point that he's got five uh, people that would support his situation. I just, I think it's important that we get 10 people pulling the thing the same way and not five. Well, you got to be able to count in this game that we're in. And that's the best way I've ever known to count is get other committees involved and and uh, get them on board and, and then back them up and help them. I, I'm all for a broad coalition. The Health and Welfare Committee is also dealing with a umpteen hundred million dollar hospital relief bill. And the Ed Committee's got to deal with the Ed Fund and the colleges and childcare. So let's all, can we all agree that we're going to figure out a strategy as long the, the, that we don't want it coming out of the ag bucket of money and we want these to go forward and we'll figure out what are the best, you know, that we got to be protective of our, of our allotment of money. And I just, under normal times, absolutely. You would just say, here's some ideas. We hope you'll do this. I just am not super confident that it will happen if we, 
jettison this. So I'd like to reserve the chance to either get confirmation it will happen somewhere else, or as long as the money's not coming out of our bucket, figure out if we maybe are smart to do it here. Well, I'd love to do it if they'd give us an extra few million dollars. Without question, absolutely. I'd be more than happy to do it because it really needs to be done. But, um, you know, I, I'm sure that education and health and welfare's number is going to be much greater than our number to start with. And it seems like they'd have more leeway uh, to, to do more with a large pot of money than a small pot of money. Now, I, but, I understand the, the issues we face politically and whatnot, but it's hard for me to imagine the Senate saying no to a package of anti-hunger programs at this time, at this time and given the situation we're in, it's just hard to imagine it not moving forward. I couldn't wait, I couldn't imagine the arguments that are gonna be made on the floor as to why we shouldn't fund hunger programs. That's right. But I think, you know, we've got an advantage there just be given the emergency issue that we're dealing with. Okay, so Chris, we're all, I think, pretty much in agreement that we either get more money or we help the other committees with their proposals and add this in and support them on the Senate floor to, to achieve the goal. Yeah, yes. okay, Michael. So, Senator Hardy and I will, will bounce back to the respective committees and, and does that make sense? We'll check back in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sounds good. Yeah. So yeah, I, I am yeah, leaving I them in. I'm sorry, go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, I, I just wanted to make it clear, I'm not against either initiative. I just didn't want to have a bill coming out of Senate Ag that said, here's what we think. And oh, by the way, you guys are going to pay for it. We're not. <laughs> I just didn't, you know what yeah. I mean? I didn't, I didn't think that was a good idea. Y'all know you don't care about feeding kids, Brian. No problem. <laughs> yeah, starve them suckers. <laughs> yeah. And don't educate them either. <laughs> Uh, no, no, if push comes to shove, we'll, we'll take care of the kids <laughs> and the old folks. <laughs> uh, okay, Michael. Uh, let's so I'm go. leaving, I'm leaving them in the, the bill for now. Yeah. Okay. So the, the next program would be a grant program run by AOE, but it's to provide um, grants to school food authorities for equipment that they may need to implement COVID-19 public health precautions and to address an, an increased demand. So it, it, Linda, you can go on to page two. Um, you'll see uh, um, money would be appropriated to the agency of ed from the coronavirus relief fund to award grants to school food authorities for cost of point of sale equipment, packaging equipment, or other equipment uh, required in order to comply with COVID-19 public health precautions when providing school nutrition services. So next year, food, school lunches are going to be provided in the classroom in order to uh, comply with social distancing requirements. They won't be in the cafeteria. So schools are going to need to buy packaging equipment and point of sale equipment for their students in order to be able to, to provide the necessary services. And so this is, would be an equipment grant or a grant for that type of equipment. Um, it would be administered by the agency of ed. Um, <clears throat> and then you'll see that they, the awards would be, uh, available to a school food authority that demonstrates the need for equipment due to the COVID public health emergency or expenditures for equipment that they already incurred between March 1, 2020 and November 30th, 2020 due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. So if they've already spent to buy this equipment due to COVID-19, um, they are not ineligible. They can still um, receive a payment for that. See, that, that should be hooked 
with the other bill though and go to Ed. Right. I, I think the, the remainder of the sections in the bill are all those types of sections. They're all about um, uh, an, uh, either a, a nutrition program, um, school nutrition programs, or the uh, appropriation to the Vermont Food Bank. Um, so should I talk with Bill Ruth in regards to this stuff? Because, you know, this should be going to to education. So I, I mean, if you'd like to, I, I already talked to the committee and they were just, oh. and I think they're supportive of us working on it and then ha having them take a look at it. And I, I just, um, I, I don't know exactly what the right strategy is. I just don't want this to get lost. And right now in the education committee, we don't have a big COVID relief bill like we do here in the Ag Committee. So should we should we kind of go through this then and shape it up so that if we do send it to, to Phil and education, it'll be pretty much right? Yeah, I think that would be helpful, Bobby. Well, we may as well, we've got 45 minutes left. We may as well run through this then, Michael, and and um, and try to shape it up or see if it needs any additional uh, work. Okay. Michael, what, what, what are you, you said uh, point of sale yeah. uh, equipment. Is that like sometimes in a restaurant, when you pay with a credit card, they bring over the little thing right to your table and you do, is that what we're talking about? Right, so um, most kids have a code that they, that they use in order to access their, their um, school food accounts or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're gonna need to have something like that portable that they can take around to the different classes. So when uh, lunches are delivered, the kid can code in their code and-, and did, did, um, So that's what I thought. Did Rosa give you a crude number for that? No, she did not. See, I, I think- I can't help but think, Mr. Chair, that uh, we're gonna spend $11 million on some little computer system so everyone can punch in their code, or we yeah, can spend $18 million and just feed them all. On this is school lunches. this is a dumb. That whole deal's a dumb idea. Why don't they stagger the lunch periods? Most in our schools, uh, our lunch, uh, our lunch is provided in the school gym. Well, you let a hundred kids into that gym, you can keep them six feet apart, and they could eat off their same trays. They wouldn't be lugging food around so it'd be cold when it gets to the classroom. But uh, Ruth? Yeah, I just want to say on this piece, um, I do want to caution you that they haven't made any decisions yet about how schools are going to, you know, do the their lunch periods um, in the fall. I think there's a speculation that it will be done in the classroom in order to maintain social distancing, but no decision has definitely been made. And I think it will also depend on the school. Some of the tinier schools may be able to have their lunch programs run the same way because there just aren't that many kids, but certainly the Burlington schools are going to have to rework their, their, if any of you have ever gone to lunch at Burlington High School, there's no way they can do it the same way because there are just so many kids. So I think it depends on the school. So when I had a conversation with Rosie about this piece, Michael, um, it was, I, I, I thought it made more sense to hold off on this until the next round of things, until we know more about how schools are gonna work um, in the fall, because we just don't have enough information yet. Um, and I also think the, the, the term equipment might, it, it's more like equipment and supplies, because some of it is supplies for their packaging, and some of it is equipment in order to package things. Um, so this may be a little, this part of it might be premature and maybe focusing on the summer stuff um, is, is a better way to go. 
Um, Whatever just, the committee wants. Just hold it in your back pocket because I think okay. we might need to come back to this once we have more idea of how schools are going to work in the fall. Okay. okay, so where do we, food service, um, where do we go next, Michael? So that would be uh, on the alternative language, uh, section 12. It's a, it's a school food service worker retention benefit. Um, there's been some discussion about how the food service workers um, are um, maybe kind of at a threshold where they may be leaving um, and the schools need them now for the summer meals program and going into the fall and that they're um, a, a hazard pay benefit would help retain some of those school food um, service workers. And so this is similar to uh, what you've seen in a couple of other places where they're on page four of the um, alternative document, um, line eight, subsection C, there would be established a school food service worker retention program to award eligible food service workers with a $500 um, direct relief grant payment. Uh, the agency of ed probably doesn't have the um, resources to administer it, the program itself. So you'll see on page four, line 15, that they may implement the program either through block grants to school food authorities for awards to school food service workers or by contracting with the public or private entity to conduct outreach pr process grant applications and deliver grant payments. Um, so the rest of it is kind of just administrative. The agency has the ability to set the guidelines and set the application and what the process would be um, there are some limitations on um, the can, what a school district supervisory union or independent school should provide, that they can't require any eligible food service worker to pay an administrative fee um, in order to obtain the grant payment. They can't reduce the hourly compensation of the worker. Um, and uh, that's basically it. Uh, the the payment would go to the food school authority um, who would then uh, distribute, distribute it to the, the worker within five days of receipt. Um, that's, that's the program. I do want to mention two things. It would include uh, workers at school districts, supervisory unions, and independent schools. And it also includes, um, in some schools, they contract with providers, um, private in companies to provide the school nutrition services, those workers would still likely be eligible. Um, there is an opportunity for uh, the, because this would not be considered income from underneath that contract, the, the school or the food service authority could uh, negotiate with the private contractor in order to allow for payment of this benefit to those those school workers who are operating under a contract uh, instead of working directly for the school. Yep. <clears throat> um, discussion, any questions on this uh, about, <clears throat> you know, this is part of that whole educational piece, I would think, right, Ruth? Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, definitely. And, and I think that, uh, Michael, putting in some language about it, some of these, if, if that essential workers bill does actually ever pass the house, some of the, the ones that work for the contract groups like the Abbey group would qualify for that essential worker bill. Um, so maybe some language that they can't have received those payments or UI payments or whatever, that sort of standard. I think you had that in the yeah. farm worker bill. Yeah. And then okay. also, does it make sense to put dates in any, you know, have been employed from March 1st through whatever? I don't, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it seems to me that, you know, there are some food service workers who worked 
during the height of this crisis and then some we want to make sure work this summer and next fall but I, I don't know if dates would be helpful in defining who we're talking about um th that that's a yeah i i understand your position um i can add that into the definition of a food school food service worker if you would like and, that, and then the third thing is about uh uh, does this, would this cover, and do we want it to cover people who are the administrators of the program, like the food service directors and things like that, or do we just want it to cover the frontline people? So the frontline people are the ones that get paid, you know, if not minimum wage, not too high above minimum wage, that uh, I would think the directors are yeah pretty well taken care of i would hope no. yeah i agree i think I'm it's that the... pardon uh, i'm not confident these people are i mean i don't know maybe we could just have an income threshold or something yeah like we did in, the, in yeah. the hazard pay and then the other the final thing is is that like i said some of these this spring some of these workers were paraprofessionals who were sort of brought into working in food service and they may not, that may not be what their job was, but we, I would think we would want to cover them too, because they were brought in to package and deliver and, you know, really worked their, worked a lot on food service, even though that wasn't their job. So, so in the definition of, of school food service worker includes those employees of the school who were repurposed from their normal duties in order to perform previously on budgeted food services. I thought that we were working, one of the other committees working on a bill to help uh, municipalities and school workers, uh, you know, in a separate bill from the one that we've already sent the House. thought there was a bill coming along that dealt with municipal and school employees. Have none of you have heard anything about that? There is a bill that's a municipal funding bill, $16 million, that I think goes to reimburse at least municipalities for some of the expenses of staff and whatnot that has been affected by the, by the pandemic. It's actually coming to the floor this afternoon, I think. I'm not sure if there's a bill you're talking about, but it might be. But isn't there something for school also, school. People? I didn't see school in the bill that I'm thinking of, but I could have just missed it. I don't. No. I haven't heard of anything. But no. I don't know if Michael, uh, yeah, Sorokin's committee is working on something economic development. Maybe I'm not sure. Well, I guess we'll have to check that out. Okay, Bobby, I have to jump off. What what is I always think we do, uh, you know, we could talk about this for weeks to come. What What is your target? Um, do you have one and, and has Tim coordinated with you or, or what's your thinking? Well, you know, if we, if we go way back to when we started and we were gonna do like the three, the three payments to, uh, Bobby's hotline. If we go back and do the three payment deal, uh, you know, it was eight, like eight million dollars of a flat. To, well, mm -hmm. if you, you know, if, if we stay within that framework, um, and we've got the, I, I fooled with the numbers and. That was like $28 million, I think, somewhere in that neighborhood. Well, then they come out and tell us, well, you know, that's not a good deal that you can only do, you know, 30 total, and it has to include processors. So you back that all out, and you go to two and a half. I kept fooling with the numbers. If you go two and a half times what we started with, it brings you to 21, the number I gave you earlier, 
21 seven. Seven nine three seven fifty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering when you expect to move the bill. Oh, either Friday or Tuesday. I okay. I mean, we really got to, because it's got to go to the house. And yeah, no, I, I understand that. I, and I just wanted to understand the expectations. So. And, and they may, they may be willing to take our portion of the bill and move it separately without tying it to all the rest of, of Michael's uh, stuff. And so I'd like to get it out toward the end of the week uh, or Friday or, or first part of next week. We may even have to, if we wanted to do it Tuesday, we may have to work a bit on Monday to try to get it finalized and, and out. Um, yeah, we'll have to talk about time and, and all that. But if we have 21, 21 something already gone, that leaves us only seven or eight for, for the rest. And, and it's kind of tight. So anyways, um, we, uh, <clears throat> how, how do you think? the the parts of the bill up to the food stuff uh, fell in the line. Is that pretty good, I think? Michael, did you have a piece for the, for the food bank somewhere? You, you mentioned that, but. Yeah, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention, which I, I've been thinking a lot about today when we talk about where the hunger stuff should go, is originally the idea was that the hunger stuff fit into our bill in part because we were doing things that affected hunger, but also involved Vermont food and Vermont farmers, things like the Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program at the food bank and cash crops, the NOFA program, whatnot. And I think we, we've sort of moved away from it. I'm not saying we intentionally moved away from it, but we're, we are away from that idea. I had thought that we were to combine hunger programs with programs that actually support Vermont farmers. I'm not so sure that we've done that at this point. I don't mean to throw a monkey wrench in things, but I just think it's that's a connection that we had originally talked a lot about, and now we're not talking about it so much. Yep, you're right. <laughs> we could we could embed that back into the food part of it. Yeah, I mean, that's, it wouldn't be hard to fix to, to to do it. It's just that it's got me thinking a lot about it today. Thinking about where to place the hunger programs. They should be part of that because they should be supporting farmers as well. There is well, a section in the bill. In fact, I think it's the last section about the Vermont Food Bank, and there's $4.6 million appropriated to it. So we just didn't get to that today? That's correct. Uh, I talked to the food bank about their needs um, and why they're having those needs and how they were related to COVID-19. So I wrote in a finding section to lay out the rationale for it. According to the food bank, there's been an increase in food insecurity of 46% due to the lost employment business closure, a significant business interruption caused by COVID-19, and that the operating costs of the food bank and its partners have increased significantly in the order to address the dramatic increase in, in food needs, and that in order to meet the need of Vermonters facing food insecurity, the food bank and its partners will need additional funds to purchase more food, provide subgrants to food shops and meal sites, and fund additional personnel materials and supplies. In addition, they need some money to navigate the USDA's um, CFAP program to get the food assistance that, that's available under that, um, and specifically for distribution because they've been using the National Guard for a lot of their distribution, and it's, that's not necessarily uh, um, going to continue. Um, and so accessing the federal funds will help the food bank ensure successful food distribution to Vermonters' needs. And then you get to the appropriation that Senator Conmore referenced, in addition to any funds appropriated to the Department of Health in 21 for providing this nutrition services to Vermonters. We, 4.6 is appropriated from the Corona Relief Fund to the Department of Health for distribution to the food bank 
for use prior to December 30th, 2020 to pay the additional costs, including costs of personnel, food materials, warehouse space, delivery services, and equipment necessary to meet the increased food security needs of Vermonters caused by the COVID-19 public health emergency. <clears throat> That's good. I would like to see the Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program mentioned in there somehow. Because that's the one where they actually buy from Vermont farmers. I'm not saying they don't get other stuff from Vermont, from, Vermont, from Vermont farmers, but Vermonters Feeding Vermonters is the program that they've been, they were lobbying us to push to support before we had to leave the building. Um, right, remember, uh, I, I don't know enough about that program to, to respond to the question. Yeah, all I know about all I know is they say that basically it means the food bank is buying stuff directly from Vermont farmers at market prices. So maybe instead of referencing the actual program, Anthony, because it's unclear what the status of it is, we say that some language about wanting them to buy food at market prices from far, from Vermont, Vermont farmers. Producers. Yeah, and then the other thing, Michael, you know. There is this program that people can be eligible for, SNAP, that would help them. And I'm wondering if the food bank and other agents, if we should put language in there saying that we technical assistance to help people apply for food assistance programs like SNAP or something like that. Because, you know, it's, it's great to give away food, but really we want to have a more long lasting solution which is to get people on programs where they can buy the food themselves and obviously get them back to work so they have income etc but you know in the interim when they need that food assistance getting them on the snap program that also helps eligibility for school food programs so oh, i could read your lips yeah i could read your lips and find so I took the numbers, at least that I've been writing down. So Bobby's dairy number was 21793750. Then add in the 4.6 million for the food bank and the 192,000 for Gus's shop. And it comes out to 26,585,750 right now, which is close to the ceiling, but there's still a little bit there. And I'm sure we can probably find well, yeah, but the big issue, Brian, is there isn't a dime in any of that for the processing. And uh, I, want, yeah. I want to make sure and take care of the, the turkeys and the, you know, chickens and the beef and, you know, have a little bit left for them. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it's really getting pretty tight. And I thought we'd have eight you know, eight million for that, but the the food stuff we'd have to get more money. But I know that's a critical piece to to deal with. Yeah, if you subtract what we've already sort of played with in terms of allocation, and take that away from the thirty, you're left with three point four million, which, as you point out, is probably shy of the process of need that we have. Well, what the agency had was 10 for them and, and 40, 40 for us. Yeah. And now that we've got 30 for everybody, so we're 20 million short. So it, somebody's getting going to get shorted. Yep. Yeah. Maybe we can all play around with the numbers this afternoon and talk about them more tomorrow morning. And Michael can. Yeah, we may that. have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyhow. Um, the Michael, food can you add the line about the local food on the. Yeah. The, you know, the, the food stuff, it, it adds up really quick to for all the hunger that we're facing. And I, I still have trouble understanding why everybody is so hungry because of, you know, everybody got anywhere from zero to $1,200, most citizens. Um, 
you know, the schools have been putting meals out five and six days a week uh, to all the children. Uh, the National Guard has been putting food out from the military. The, you know, the, the unemployment has been increased to anywhere from, you know, with that extra $600 for the unemployed uh, from the feds on top of the Vermont uh, unemployment. Um, I, I don't know, it's just rough for me to understand why, you know, you see miles of car lines uh, waiting to pick up food. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess I, I'm not in Burlington or the bigger places where it even could be more compounded and more problems, but. Uh, well, I, I think a lot of the programs that people just rely on getting food from are not happening. And, and in fact, the numbers for feeding kids in school are down, particularly in the Chittenden County area because they're not doing delivery. So kids are oh. not getting the school food as much they may be more in our areas, Bobby, where they're delivering, but they're lower in Rutland County and they're lower in Chittenden County. Or where the cities are. Yeah. Yep. And, and then also people um, are still having a hard time getting their unemployment benefits. There's still challenges with getting those. And I think there's just a general insecurity out there. And not everybody got those $1,200 checks and those go pretty fast when you have to pay rent. Um, so... I think there's just a, a huge insecurity and people are worried and nervous and so many people didn't have any kind of cushion at all. So, you know, their cushion went away in two days and then they're, yeah. they're scrambling to make ends meet in a, in this really difficult time and, and everybody, nobody knows what the future is going to be. So that makes it even harder. Yeah. It's not a easy time right now. That's for sure. Um, well, um, so, I mean, the, the food issues of, you know, it's expensive and it's a big issue and it's a necessity. And you'd think that, you know, health and welfare would be really drilling down and, and getting into this stuff, but I don't know if they are. Um, but I think, you know, we've done our, our share and, and see, I was going to do maybe if we had that 50, we would still do maybe 10 toward the food stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and we, have, we haven't got 10. Uh, but anyways, um, we, um, Chris is going to talk to Jenny, uh, you know, in health and welfare and see what they can do. And I talked with Jane some about maybe getting, trying to get a little bit more money so we could deal with, with this. And we haven't reached a resolve on that, but she's very adamant that we not spend all of our money because of the unknowns that could be coming later on uh, this year. Um, so do you have anything else, Michael? No, not right now. <laughs> um, so you want to, you want to go back to the beginning and play with any of the numbers or play with the numbers separately and we'll start tomorrow morning, uh, dealing with those. I have no witnesses lined up because I, we need to work on this ourselves. I'd like to go and meet in room 11 and around a big table where we could be six feet apart and discuss the damn thing. It, it can, would... I, can I ask what? you, um, you guys, what you think, uh, and Michael, uh, the, you know, we have that, the, the non dairy farmer piece of it all together, the processors and, and everything. 
And do you think it's better to have them all together or is it easier to separate out the cheese processors because then we can do it some kind of based on volume of milk processed or does it work okay to have them all together? I'm sort of going back and forth on whether I think it's better or not to have them together. And uh, what are your thoughts, uh, anybody? <laughs> Nobody has thoughts. Okay. <laughs> well, you go either way. <laughs> I mean, I think it makes I think it makes more sense to put them all together. I'm not even always sure why, but it just seems like it's all agriculture and it's all farmers, and they should be together in, in one piece of one piece of law. So I, I'm not convinced of that, but that's just more my gut goes. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what I was thinking too. But then when we get to, into the sort of how do we distrib how do we decide the payment amounts? That's when it gets. It's going to separate itself anyway, eventually. True. Well, what we could do is, if we do the dairy part, and we know how much we want to do with the food part, if we're if we're going to have to do that, or do dairy and give the agency the number and then that we expect them to use on dairy and then just give them another number and say, this is for you to figure out how to hand out to the processors. Um, you know, we wouldn't have to work that down to uh, bare bones. We, it would be up to them to devise a system to pay it out to the processors. <laughs> My only concern is I, I, I want to make sure that we take care of the little guys, and I'm a little worried that the agency might have well, different ideas about that. I, in our dairy, in our dairy stuff, we we have done that. You know the the small and the small and the. Um, a small certified are getting, you know, quite a lot more money than the big guys. If you add the medium and the smalls, uh, they're getting quite a lot, a lot more than than uh, the little, you know. Oh no! If if you take the medium, uh, oh shit! This is the wrong paper. Um, but I figured it all out. So, you know, we're using the, the little guys, you know, as good as you possibly can and still help the big guys some. I guess I'd be in favor of each of us just taking a spreadsheet and yeah. Taking it, taking it apart, putting it back together. Maybe have two or three different options, and uh, when we get together tomorrow, we'll have all that stuff done at least. We do have a couple of witnesses tomorrow. Uh, Linda, will let us know. Gus and Nick Richardson are coming in tomorrow morning. They're coming tomorrow, not Friday. Well, that's what Linda said in the look in the chat box. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Brian. I didn't see that. What no. time are we supposed to meet tomorrow? Are we meeting at nine again? Yes. Sure. That's what I was planning on because some of the subgroups meet beforehand and it makes it rough. Um, yeah, ours is meeting tomorrow at 7.30, so. Yeah. Ours is done. What time, Brian? Ours is all done, I hope. We met this morning oh. at eight. Yeah. Um, so we'll... We'll plan to meet. Um, we'll plan to meet in the morning at nine, and we'll go through till noon again. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, if you have any ideas with the numbers, work them hard. All right. Thank you so much, Michael. So okay, can I just? I just want to confirm what you want from me for next product. You want a sheet with all of the appropriations decisions on it. Um, so basically the, the dairy assistance, the processor assistance, and all the other appropriations. Um, you, I'm going to revise the draft somewhat. I'm going to include the alternative food service 
language that for schools that that I I walked you through today because that's not in the overall bill um, right now. Uh, and then I'm just going to make some minor revisions that you requested or that I noticed some typos and things like that. So I, I will I will have all of that for you tomorrow. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And um, okay, folks. Yeah, we'll see you on the floor. Thanks, guys. See you later. Yeah, thank you.